first and foremost, equity and inclusion, why it matters. <clears throat> so we, um, we live in a very unique time um, in, in the United States. And for those that are teachers in training, for those that have been in the classroom and continue to be in the classroom, um, both as a teacher and as an administrator, it's, um, we have lots of changes. 20 years ago, for most of us that are sitting up here, when we went through teacher ed, um, it started with ex characteristics of exceptional children and a conversation about differential learning. Clearly, in the 20 years since we've been out of school, I keep telling myself I'm not old, but 20 years is a long time, um, that differential learning looks a lot different today. Our students in the classroom look different. The students that we get in, my, in our role here for those that are on college here on campus are different. So how do we navigate um, inclusivity? How do we navigate hard subjects? Um, with a very changing flow of teachers and students, that has to look a little different. I read several articles recently that said Illinois teachers are roughly 85 to 86% white, while our students, the students in K-12, are 58% non-white. So we have to pause and ask ourselves, both in K-12 and in higher ed, what are we doing and can we do things differently to make a difference in our students' lives? So this is how this panel has come to fruition. Everybody that is both virtual and in person are on the college grads um, and have teaching degrees. So for those of you that don't know me, I am Regina Johnson. I am currently the Director for Multicultural Student Services here on campus. Um, I started in a high school classroom at Galesburg High School 20 years ago um, before I made the decision to leave the classroom. Um, now, after 10 years out, I have returned to Monmouth College in the summer of 2016, and I have been in the current role that I am in. Um, equity and inclusion has always been something I've been very passionate about. Um, even when I was a classroom teacher, even when I was uh, in corporate, um, I think differential learning and treating people with respect um, based off of where they come from is how you forge relationships forward. Um, but I would honestly say that the changing landscape for me um, really shifted when I came back to Monmouth College um, as my husband and I navigated having an exceptional learner ourselves. And knowing what that process has been like and knowing the hurdles um, that we have had to overcome made me dig in to how we do better even more. So that is a little bit about me. I am one of your moderators this evening and I will turn it over to our other moderator to introduce himself and give you a little bit of that. Thank you very much, Regina. My name is Chris Fors. I am a 2009 graduate. Uh, I'm the principal of United High School, which is just down the road here in Mama. Originally from Moline, Illinois, go Maroons. Uh, this would be my overall 12th year in education. I started my career off as a junior high science teacher. Uh, I served as an assistant principal at Burlington, Iowa. I was a junior high principal for four years, and this is my first year as a high school principal. As I sit here and reflect on what we're going to be talking about tonight and speaking specifically to the um, students who are getting ready to student teach either this semester or next semester, um, we aren't used to as teachers being such a focal point of hot button topics. Education is always important. It's always something um, that is on the national landscape in conversations. But um, right now is a unique time, like Regina said, because we are at a um, kind of a, under a microscope in terms of um, what is the, the landscape and conversation that's being had around equity and inclusion. So it's really important to understand that whether you enter a school uh, as a rural school or an urban school, it's something that uh, is going to be discussed. It's something um, that we all have to have a, a broader conversation about. Um, I think that's why it's so important to have events like we're having tonight so we can um, talk about things so we can become more aware, uh, more educated, uh, but also to prepare you guys for entering the field of education um, and just understanding and being able to have a conversation about it. So 
I'm very, very honored. This is a full circle moment for me uh, to be able to serve on this panel. Um, I really appreciate Regina and everybody um, for giving me the opportunity. Hi, I'm Willie Mendez. I graduated in 2018. I teach high school Spanish at Farm Beach and Central High School, like an hour from here. Um, I'm originally from the of Chicago, and I student taught Chicago, so I've seen city schools, I've seen rural schools, so I have a little perspective on both. Um, Spanish is my first language. I'm a first generation student, so not an administrator like some of the other people on the panel, but I have <laughs> a perspective on all this. I'm Toby Ballas. I'm a 1998 graduate. Um, <laughs> I spent, although I am a, a person of color, technically, I've spent my entire career in rural schools. I graduated from Knoxville, um, right down the road, which is predominantly white. I spent a lot of my career there. And now I'm the director of student services at Farmington, which falls into that same category. So. Hi, I'm Zach Chatterton. I'm the superintendent in Farmington, and I'm a class of 99 graduate, although it seems a little bit more awkward to me because I think really they were chasing me out of town and they gave me a piece of paper on the way out. <laughs> uh, I'm very honored to be here with all of you, and at this, uh, this topic is very important to me, and I hope it's important to all of you, and you're not just here to get your credit or your CBDs or whatever that may be. Um, I'm sure we'll get into the specifics of that here in a little bit. We're just doing introductions now, but I just want to say I'm really excited to be here. And I'll send it on down the line to whoever's next. Kenny. Hey, good evening, folks. My name is Ken Morris Jr. I am originally from Peoria, Illinois. Um, attended um, Monmouth and graduated in 2000. I currently am the Director of Equity at Ankeny Community School District, and um, I'm just delighted to be here uh, to have this important conversation. Um, I applaud Monmouth, um, the Office of Intercultural Life, um, the Alumni Department for your courageousness in creating um, a brave and um, courageous space for us to have this conversation um, in an authentic way. And um, I hope that, you know, there's some key learnings and takeaways um, for all of you in attendance um, in person, as well as in the Zoom space. I'm gonna turn it over to my, my girl, Ronnie. She's rocking my name. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, not sure how that happened. Oh, because he sent me the link. Um, <laughs> I'll explain that shortly. Um, I am Veronica Alexander. Um, I graduated in 2003. I'm um, currently a fourth grade teacher um, in Chicago, on the west side of Chicago. Um, but my career has um, taken so many different paths. Um, I've taught kinder first, um, every grade from kinder through fourth. Um, but I've also um, served as um, a reading coach for teachers, um, and I love that work. Um, and I'm currently in school to receive my master's um, to continue that work um, and just helping teachers grow um, and, and putting in that work to kind of just figure out what it is that we need to do to make sure that all children have access to the same education, um, just the same resources, but to continue what I've learned from Monmouth um, and, and just pushing that work forward. So I'm excited to be here. This is my first panel ever. Um, so I just am appreciative of the experience um, and the opportunity to be a part of this conversation. And I'll change my name right now. <laughs> Thank you, Veronica. So we're going to dig in. Um, the questions this evening are broken down into three, three takeaways, three categories. We're going to talk about students, what landscape looks like for students and the ever-changing processes that they face. We're going to talk about teachers, staff, and administrators, what, what we need to be doing better, um, and provide tools and resources to doing better in that capacity. Um, and then the third area is community. Most um, all of us 
Um, and those of you that are in teacher training and those that are teacher certified, both virtually and in person, um, a lot of the things that we are going to you pull through as an educator have to do with the community in which your school is in. So what sort of partnerships and different activities happen for you um, as a community basis? So three areas, students, staff, teachers, administrators, and community are what we are going to discuss tonight. And so our opening question and conversation that we're going to go into really is the elephant in the room. Why equity work, right? Um, all of us, and this was intentional, those of you that know me, um, and for those of you that don't know me, I tend to be pretty intentional when I do these things. Um, so the why was bringing these people together in their panel. I clearly knew that they were doing some sort of work to drive the needle forward. Um, so we're going to open with our whys. Why are, have you chosen to do equity and inclusion work? Um, I know Chris and I share similar um, experiences. So my why in equity and inclusion work? I said I had a child, right, that um, is an exceptional learner. Um, but I, like some of the other panelists, grew up in uh, right outside of Peoria in an all-white school. I may appear to some to be white, but I am not. Um, I identify as Black, and so my father is Black, my mother is white, um, except she's European white. My grandmother got her um, U.S. citizenship when my, when my mom was 16. So I grew up in a house where English was not my grandmother's first language. So it was always very important to me to, to change the path, especially when I decided to be a teacher. Um, because I know growing up, I didn't have somebody that was um, a leader or an instructor that looked like me. I didn't identify with any of my teachers until I got to college. Um, and so that was why I have thrown myself into this work sometimes too much. Um, and the, the, the genuineness behind making sure that all students have a platform that their voices can be heard. So I'm going to have Chris share, and then we're going to open up to our, our co-panelists and have them discuss why they have made the decision and what are some things that drive them in equity and inclusion work. Um, my why as an administrator and as a teacher, and what you're going to um, soon discover, those of you that are entering the field of education, is there's no student that is exactly the same. And all of your students have a different story. And there's value as the adults and as the leaders of your school to make sure that all those students have a voice. So that's my why, because all of us on this panel, all of you sitting in this room, you have different stories. And because of that, you bring different value to your classrooms. Your story, you're going to bring an individual value to your classroom because of your upbringing, because of your culture, because of your shared experiences, and because of your unique experiences. Um, so that's my why, is to provide a loving environment uh, where we are accepting of all students, um, because again, everyone's story matters. And there's, there's a power of having individual stories, not any story um, that a student tells is the same, um, and it's important that we honor that. My why would mostly be like why I chose to leave Chicago and go to girls' schools. Um, going to my high school, it's 92% Hispanic. Everyone spoke Spanish. My home life in, at my house we speak Spanish. So why leave the comfort of that and come to Monmouth, teach in Farmington? I think it's bringing a different perspective. And a lot of times in the classroom, my kids will ask questions like, you do this at your house or like you celebrate this here, or like why do you do this? And I think it's important to start opening minds of the kids to like what they're going to face outside of wherever they grow. That would be my why. I think um, my why as I'm, I'm realizing as I get older is it's kind of been a search for personal identity. Um, I was adopted by a white family. Uh, I didn't I didn't know my mom, didn't know my dad. And I grew up widely accepted as, as a white person in a small rural community. And uh, 
I think that was great. And then I came to Monmouth for some of the best years of my life. And I met these people from other cultures and I realized my identity was missing. And uh, my 20s were a, a tumultuous time in my own mind, probably, as I tried to figure out what was missing from my life. And, you know, it was, it was a mix of adoption and, and diversity and poverty and all these things, all these issues that I was working through as I got older. And then as a teacher, I realized all these kids are working through these same things. And I was hearing these things that I knew hurt me because I knew I was different, but everyone else didn't see that. And I, I realized that a lot of people, they just, they just don't know. They don't know how that feels and how it works. And I could see these kids in my, in my classroom and in the hallway that felt the same way I felt when I was at that age and, and had nowhere to go with it. And uh, I think it's important for me that everybody has somewhere to go with it. So it looks like we have 15 participants online. I see Ken and Veronica there, but I don't know about the other 13. And that doesn't necessarily, it does matter. It does matter, but there's about 30 of you here right now. And it looks like you already strongly disagree with us. So we'll try to get to the other side of the room and get done here. <laughs> but you all look like I do. Right. And I'm a relationship person. I, I'm assuming you all work with children or desire to work with children, right? The number one thing in order to help kids is to be a people person and establish relationships. And you have to find some sort of common ground. And in education, this is just my personal observation is that, and I'm not minimizing any of these, but if a kid has a medical condition, man, we'll throw lots of resources at that. I mean, our hearts really pour out for a kid with medical conditions. Then along came, and this before my time in education, but then along came this exceptional learners and children that had to learn in different ways and such. And man, we throw a lot of resources at that. And we really, really get after helping them and being inclusive with them. And then, actually, while I was in the classroom working with, with, with kids, it came to be gender identity. You know, we had, we had some students that were gay or you know, what they're identifying as differently. And that seemed to be fine, too. People were, came around, you know, we're all worried about what bathrooms people were using. And I know that there's still some concern with that. I haven't seen a problem, knock on wood, in any of the schools I've worked in. And I, I've been in one, two, three, four school districts, and I, I think probably 20 buildings within four school districts. And I understand any problems with that, but when it come to, comes to ethnicity and race, there's always been that underlying elephant in the room that we just haven't come around with in education. And I don't know why that is, but that's my why, because I don't understand why. Because we've got to work on that. We've got to acknowledge that that's a variable that hinders those relationships, or it doesn't hinder, but it has to be a part of the conversation when you're establishing those relationships. So that's my why. Kenny, Veronica? You go ahead, Ronnie. Um, so, I really, when I left Monmouth, um, I started off as an assistant teacher um, and I started off at a school, um, the Latin School of Chicago up north um, in Chicago. Very well, um, very well put together, um, very structured um, school that had lots of resources. Um, and while I enjoyed my experience there, um, I realized that I wasn't really kind of giving my best and my all um, to the students because they, and from just my perspective, kind of had everything and just, you know, really were excelling at school. And so um, I chose to um, accept the position at a charter school um, on the West side. Um, for me, it started off as wanting to um, be a representation for students that look like me that didn't necessarily always have teachers that look like them. Um, and as I've gone on in my career, um, you know, after doing soul searching and just kind of living life, um, I've realized that, you know, it's more than just looking like the students in front of you, but having those experiences and being able to recognize that, um, you know, children and families are coming in with so much, um, whether it's um, 
you know, gender identity, but um, race, um, mental illness, you know, all of these things are coming into the classroom daily. Um, and my why for continuing this work is to give those families, to give those students um, that voice and just that knowledge of what is beyond their circumstance or their situation. Um, and I am thankful that I've had some of the experiences that I've had in my own life because that is, has lent my, you know, my ability to reach um, students that some may have given up on um, just because of their circumstance. So um, it, it's so important for me to make sure that students have um, not just those physical needs in the classroom, but their emotional needs, their families, um, understandings and needs are met um, in, in, turn, in, 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 an, in an ability or um, that their needs are met so that their students can be as successful um, as those that just have everything and have those resources readily available. Yeah, so my why, um, it, it started in eighth grade transitioning to ninth grade. And, um, and, and, and back in the day in Peoria, the high school counselors would come over um, to, I went to a, a K-8, they would come over to those schools and sign you up for classes. Um, you know, I, my parents told me to select college prep. And when the counselor asked, you know, what educational track, I said college prep and he just stopped. And, you know, this is a white man. And, 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 you know, he was like, you know, you're not college material. You should really consider, uh, get going gen ed. So you can, you know, maybe consider a career in the trades or in the military, which there's nothing wrong with that. But he didn't give me a choice and he didn't give me a choice based off of limited information. Um, only I can only now um, the only thing I could tell is that I was just a black boy. And so he, um, you know, he's a gatekeeper. And, and so right there in that instance, he was a firefighter. He doused the fire in me before it could even, you know, you know, uh, set a blaze. And from that point, I set very low expectations for myself. And um, I had a lot of work that I had to work through um, from that experience back in 1989. That stuff still plagues me to this day. And, um, and, and so my point is that that experience, you know, um, has led me to dedicate my career to be, becoming a fire lighter. And, and lighting a fire up under students, staff, whoever I work with, I see the vision of who they can be, um, not the current person of who they are in front of me. And, and so um, that's my why. And, and, and I um, am unapologetic in that, in, in that you know, I don't accept mediocrity um, like I did for myself early on. The person that I am now, I wish I had who was in that counselor's position because there's no telling where I might be had someone poured into me who, who had a vision of me, um, who thought of me higher than what I even thought of myself at the time. And so I, I find that um, a lot of our kiddos, um, regardless of how they come to us, um, they need that champion. They need someone um, in their corner, being that warm demander, um, you know, asking of them and pushing of them and, 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 and not settling for mediocrity, um, but pushing them to greatness and to excellence. And, and so that's my why, you know, I, I want to create harmonious human relationships. And, um, you know, I want to give all of our students, you know, what they need, you know, whether it's um, human resources, uh, fiscal resources, uh, social emotional resource, whatever they need, that's going to help them to um, go to grade level standards and beyond. Thank you, Ken. Um, and actually, that's a really good segue. Um, and that's uh, the first question that I'm going to go ahead and open with. Um, we have both we have two people that are that have experiences working in more urban schools, and then we have a, a panel of um, that work in more rural schools. So even though rural and, and urban may share similar things, um, there are going to be some issues that might look different. So our, our question that I'm going to start with 
um, in your areas, have you been able to identify um, situations or areas within your schools, within your districts that may create a negative or adverse impact on any identical, identifiable population of students? Um, if you have, let's talk about what or how that impact could be avoided um, as you started unpacking all of those things. And then maybe what precautions or if implementations that you put into place to make the change for the difference. What was the question again? <laughs> you, you said a whole lot. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Nothing has changed in 20 years, right? <laughs> okay, so I'll break, it, I'll break it down. So the first one, what areas have you identified in your districts that create a negative or adverse impact on an identifiable population of students? Something I've noticed, um, I think it's hard to keep up on terminology. Um, you know, all, all of us find ourselves behind on it. And I work with some really great people. There's not one person in our district that I don't like. And some people, and thank you. And, uh, <laughs> there's only one person in our <laughs> But I think it's hard, um, and myself included in this, to keep up on the proper terminology, not only to be not offensive, but to be on top of things. And, you know, we talk about all this professional development and all these things, but I think anybody can catch themselves using the wrong word or saying the wrong thing in a totally innocent manner. And I'm talking about people that I love. You know, I, I love these people that I work with. And, you know, sometimes you get in a small town and you stay there and you don't leave. And, you know, culture and things like that, they, they keep growing outside of that area. But I think it's very hard to keep up with it. And um, people that don't mean to say anything offensive, sometimes I'm using a word that's outdated in front of the kids that I'm teaching or the kids that I'm working with. And they, they think that's the word, and they genuinely believe that. I think some of that unintended stuff um, is very hard to keep up with, especially in the, in the small schools. Not that it's an excuse that I haven't kept up on it, but um, I, I think it can be tough. I think we've all found ourselves in that situation before. Thank you, Toby. Veronica, you started with something. Go ahead. Um, so this um, question just makes me think about my very first full-time teaching job. Um, it was at a charter school um, and it was in the middle of the west side of Chicago, one of the roughest neighborhoods. Um, but many of the teachers, um, and I, let me backtrack, I was one of the founding teachers that helped open the school. Um, and so a part of that, a founding staff, um, while we're on the west side, 100% um, African American students, um, about 80% of the staff was not. Um, and so we early on just kind of came into some, um, you know, just some situations with just cultural understandings. And so um, what I loved about my principal at that time um, is she, you know, was very good at having really honest conversations. Um, about the students that we were in front of, the students that we were serving. Um, and she took a step forward and um, contacted a company that came out and kind of helped us as adults um, begin to unpack our own biases, um, have those really, really, really deep conversations to help everyone on staff, um, no matter who you were, where you were from, but understand their own biases walking into this um, this community of students and families, um, and then doing that work to make sure that no matter what teacher was in front of the children, we were giving the same to all those students, all those families. Um, and I was I was super young when, when I started, I was 22, 23, um, but that experience stayed with me so much because um, it really opened up teachers to experience that they never experienced had but it also began to help them heal you know from their own experiences with african-american students or non-experiences with african-american students that they were teaching um, but we were able to do some really great work 
um, together as a staff and grow and the, the, the leaps and bounds that some of these children were able to make because every adult took the time to understand who they were serving um, was so important. Um, and it's really something that I hold you know, dear to me. And, and, I, and I'm constantly bringing it up when I go to, to um, meetings now, just making sure that we're, we're really doing that work behind the scenes to understand no matter who we're serving, we're giving our best and really meeting them where they are. That really reminds me of something powerful that um, Regina, um, for those that don't know, Regina has been working with our staff at, at high school. And one of the first um, institutes and times that Regina came out, um, this phrase of call in before you call out. You know, we want to we want to call people in. We want to bring people in before calling people out. So when you were talking about the challenge of terminology, can you can you share maybe something that once you know you made the mistake, what happens next? Do you have any experiences or stories that you can share with us? That, um, you know, you, you you make that mistake, but then what happens next? You know, what, what are ways that maybe you addressed it, rectified it, had a conversation? What are the things to be? Veronica looks like she wants to say something too. So, <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so, so I'll use an example. Um, a very good, very good friend of mine that that is a teacher um, <laughs> was using an outdated word for African American, and and it was it was genuine, and it was it was a mistake, and you know it it, it would it'd be easy to be hurtful of it. She wasn't. She apologized. And then she shared with us about how she took it to her classroom and told kids, look, this is something you all, you all need to know. And I, I don't think there's a better way to uh, maybe make up for or fix a mistake than to go out and spread the word to our young people that, that don't know that to teach a better way. You know, so to me, that was perfect. So that, that's just a, an example. Um, I, I think the biggest thing is, is forgiveness. I saw somebody type up there, give yourself some grace. And I think, you know, I appreciate that whoever typed that. And it, I think that's hard to do for yourself, but I think we live in a very um, a point in time right now, and I think we need to give everybody grace. I think we need to, we need to one thing America is not good at is, when you think of America, I don't know that you think forgive it. And I think all of us have made mistakes. Everybody's made, made big mistakes. And, and I think forgiveness is the, is the biggest thing. Yeah, I just give me some grace with the technology. Um, I hope you can hear me on the virtual audience, but um, it was Sheldon Davis in the audience who said the LGBTQ terminology is very fluid and changes a lot. Give yourself some grace and be open to listening and learning from the LGBTQ community. And he is Dean of Students at Downers Grove, Downers Grove South. Sheldon. Are you, <laughs> Ronnie? What were you gonna say? Um, so I just the things that kind of crossed my mind with that question. Um, it, at the same school, we kind of realized that um, we had kind of gotten into a pattern where um, we noticed that quite a few students were being referred for um, services. Um, and so it became a concern, um, you know, for us as a staff and we did the work and kind of really looked at, you know, what were some of the leading causes up to students being referred, um, you know, were there more te one, one teacher or two, you know, who were doing most of the referring, but we, we really kind of worked at making sure that before, you know, we were um, putting students in that system that we were doing our due diligence to make sure that um, we weren't um, misrepresenting some of our students just because of, um, you know, a miscommunication or not really taking the time to understand what, what they needed to in order to succeed. Um, and so it was, again, just powerful work of just being able to realize, okay, we're seeing this pattern, you know, we're not comfortable with it as a school, what are we going to do? Um, and then everyone collectively, you know, working together. And there were one or two teachers that, you know, 
we're able to share, okay, this is why maybe, you know, you, you have more coming from my class, um, but because we have done that work of, of having those, those, those difficult conversations, it was a lot easier to, you know, assist those teachers that were, you know, a part of the, that pattern of just, you know, having a lot of students that they were referring for services. Um, um, and so that, that was just one of those things that we, you know, kind of saw was an issue, um, but a, as a staff worked together to um, try to improve. One thing that made me think about is, um, you know, how we review our data. Um, I, I know in, in the several um, school districts that I've been at, um, we, we, we make this over assumption that everyone is having the same experience, um, you know, especially uh, I'm in Iowa, so we're in a, a fairly homogenous state. And, and so we make an assumption that, you know, all our students are, are doing well, they're on track. Um, academically, they're going to, you know, uh, pursue, you know, post-secondary option or something of that, uh, that effect. And, you know, when, when I start looking at our, our data for all of our student groups um, and, 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 you know, really begin to, you know, uh, apply this analysis, you know, I begin to see that, you know, not every school is, not every student is having the same level of experience or access to all the goodies that the system has to offer. Um, and, and even in some cases, when I look at, you know, um, our, our, our data and, and I see the disproportionate number of students of color that are referred, um, you know, to the office or suspended, um, I see how they're overrepresented in special education and underrepresented and talented and gifted and underrepresented in AP courses and underrepresented in STEM and, and, and CTE. Um, and, and then, you know, when I do this analysis, uh, people begin to blame the kids and the families and, and, and make assumptions that um, uh, as opposed to reflecting on their own practice and 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 you know and and maybe even reflecting even deeper on you know why 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 are we um, you know especially where I'm at um, we're 85 percent white and you know and but yet our students of color um, you know they are overrepresented in discipline data and 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 relative to their number and 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 you know and and you know folks are at least in my experience, are, are you know, uh, uncomfortable, um, you know, looking at that data and not to say that, you know, um, to say you're doing something bad or you're a bad person, but to say, you know, um, you know, how might I, you know, uh, unintentionally, you know, through bias or some other mechanism, you know, I, I may be looking for a student and, and with off-task behaviors based off of uh, a, a particular uh, racial identity, um, and as opposed to you know looking for them to be smart and 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 looking and and you know connecting them, um, you know to to high quality um, instruction and opportunities um, that could you know uh, really change the trajectory of their lives and 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 so um, you know even when I was in Cedar Rapids you know I, I was looking at um, you know data in one building and our our, our poor white kids were outperforming our affluent black kids. And, and I just asked why, and no one really could understand. Um, but then someone got courageous and said, you know, well, we can't see social economic status, but we can see race. And I was like, that's a good wondering, you know? And, 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 and so, you know, my point is, you know, I, I think we just have to become more courageous um, and, and being able to disaggregate and look at our data um, in, in ways that we can see the gaps in all student groups um, to, to help them to, you know, take full advantage of, you know, what we have to offer in our educational system. We have any online questions, Thank you for that. That actually, again, segues to another question that we have on, um, on the sheet. So let's talk about programs and access. So what um, social emotional support exists for students and are all students able to access those support systems? 
Um, also, in that same question, are there policies and practices in place in your districts um, that are able to support historical and social inequity? I'm trying to be nice and not take over. So y'all looking at me and I'm looking back at y'all. <laughs> because, you know, I, I, can, I, I, I do this. So I, I turn it right to somebody else because I'll take over. <laughs> you want to talk about policies and, and practices and such? Uh, And it doesn't have to be in your current stack. I know that you can. Yeah, no, I'm current. just trying to trying to think. I look out here and I'm making the assumption that many of you are aspiring to be teachers, teacher ed program. You, you, you're trying to um, you're trying to get in the classroom and work with kids. So I don't want to poo poo your question, and I don't want to like <laughs> neglect or, or alienate myself from any part of the audience here, but. Um, I don't know if I knew anything about any policy. I was just worried about my classroom rules when I was starting teaching. I was, and so I was trying to give some tangible example for the audience in the group. Um, and you'll, you'll identify when something's not right. And you won't really go to any policy manual. You won't go to any employee handbook or any of those types of things. It's just a, a gut feeling that you know that it's not right. And you're going to have to make your own policy or ruling on how to react to that. And in a work situation, no matter whether you've been in it for a long time, like many of us have, um, or whether you're just starting out, we may have more experiences to draw on, but it's still awkward and uncomfortable and unsettling for whoever has to. So the policy is deal with it and address it. How do you do that? There's no written rule for that. So I, I would like to think that our policy is an unwritten rule that if, there, if somebody's uncomfortable or something's not right, you, you try to make it right or at least seek to understand. Um, so I, I could go through so many examples like in my educational career, but I'll, I'll, I'll draw from a, a personal one as a parent. So Julie and I just moved to our, our third school district and we had little kids and I'm sitting there taking, and I'll be honest, I, I'm, I'm in education, I believe in education, I want you all to be in education, but as far as my own personal children's education, I figure that's why they pay those teachers to do their thing. So I, say, I mean, I go to parent-teacher conferences if they need me there, but normally I, I just, I'm a little bit more hands-off. So Julie tells me, hey, Zach, you got to take Junior to uh, school tomorrow morning. I, say, ah, I usually like to get to school early and do my thing. And, and she stayed home with the kids. So, you know, she was able to do most of the stuff. But she said, you need to take them to school. They've got a thing, a little breakfast. Uh, I think it was like, yeah, I know what it was. It was donuts with dad. All right. So, <laughs> so Junior and I go granted it to school. This morning, I this morning I see all these dads and all their their kids and they're eating these donuts, drinking these ju this juice. And I'm like, this is right. What about those kids over there that their their dad isn't there? They don't have a dad or whatever, whatever it is. And so the principal is a buddy of mine. I mean, a personal friend. We hang out together. And uh, I'm like, man, this is good. So the first thing I did, I said, Junior, we ain't sitting with these guys that we hang out with all the time. We're going to go sit with these other kids that, you know, just got shoved a donut and made feel bad because they don't have a male figure there sitting with them eating a donut. Like, does that make them feel like? I couldn't imagine how those kids felt over a donut in the morning. I'm like, what do you do with that? How do you respond to that? And so afterwards, I, I waited, I, which is a sign of growth for me. Normally, I wouldn't address it right there. So I went back a day or two later, and I, I talked to my buddy, this principal. I said, hey, man, what was this? Oh, you, what's with this? Oh, yeah, it's great. Wasn't it awesome? You know, we got 
Muffins with mom coming up. Oh, he ain't getting it. <laughs> That's all right. So I said, so, you know, how does this go out? It was all oh, the parents club. They wanted to do this, you know, get the parents in the school, this, that, and the other. Like, well, this is fluid. The parents are always in the school. You don't need to have an excuse to have them in there. And so anyway, uh, I said, so what about the, the kids? Oh, we still get a donut. I was thinking and that's okay, huh? And he's like, well, you know, we'll sit with them this Saturday. And I go, no, that's not okay. You can't do this. He goes, I go, you, you can't do this. Just just make a donut day. You don't have to put that on. I want to eat a donut. Can you eat a donut? Or a muffin or whatever you want to do. I, I said, you, you can't identify like that. You know, I go, why do you think we don't have Christmas parties anymore? Like, because you're alienating and excluding, excluding people. And, uh, I could tell he just couldn't, he, th this wasn't, this wasn't happening. And uh, I was like, all right. And this is, a, and this is, these are things that are ingrained and cultural and you can apply my little donuts with dad to a lot of different situations. And that's kind of encompassing of why we're here and what we're talking about is how do you navigate and handle that? So your question about policies or, I, I don't know. You just got to navigate it and figure it out. We don't have any policies about it. We may. I, don't, I wouldn't know what they are, but <laughs> you just got to figure out how to draw people included. I'm sure you guys are all wanting to hear the end of the story on that, so, on the donuts with dads. And for some reason, my kid got redistricted a couple of years later. We <laughs> were in after school. But, so uh, the next year, I, I said, All right, when's this donuts with dad? And I made sure I got hold of the local college and I had. One year I had the baseball team there. The next year I had the local hockey team, and then they were cheering those kids on. All all the kids with dads, they were jealous because the real cool people are there eating with those kids. So that was my backdoor solution. I never did get a change. I imagine they're still doing those with dads at that school, and I, I still feel bad about that. But um, I don't know if we can ever write something or have something in stone that's going to address these underlying issues that you just have to deal with as they come up people so that's my long way around to say i don't know if we have a policy or probably should <laughs> yeah i got something to add to that in that same vein so recently um you know I, you know i had to you know support a, a principal in having a conversation with you know their cheerleading uh, coaches um, about a, a policy in their handbook that stated that, you know, the the cheer team had to have American hairstyles. And I said, okay, what, what's, what, what, what defines an American hairstyle? And, 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 you know, and as we unpacked it, a lot of these policies are just archaic. They're reflective of the norms and values of the dominant culture at the time. And they have, and many of them have not caught up with the lived realities and experiences of our students. And so, you know, I, I really, I just asked them like, what's an American hairstyle? Is, is that inclusive of locks? Is that inclusive of the Afro? You know, is that inclusive of head wraps? So if a student wore a hijab, you know, you know, would they be able to, you know, participate in cheering? We have a no cut policy. So help me understand why is this even necessary? And 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 you know, similar to um, Zach's point, you know, when when people, you know, when when we just adhere to these policies and practices for so long without really interrogating or questioning them, um, you know, it, it, it's 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 hard to come up with you know a, a, a solid rationale, and um, and and so you know I, you know that I think that gave us even more support to you know I don't think that the what and ultimately what does this have to do with with cheerleading and and performing and and it was hard for them to understand but you know I you know they 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 couldn't you know um, you know. You know, it was just difficult for them to, you know, really, you know, disassociate this piece on American hairstyle and, and no one could really define that for me. I said for some people, um, you know, their hair is an expression or an extension of who they are and whether they want to dye it or fry it or, or whatever it is that they want to do, you know, that that's a part of their expression and who they are and who are we to tell them that it's not American. Um, you know, I, and, and so that was, a, to me, that, that, that was, you know, relatively, you know, easy to, you know, um, overwrite 
that just because it, it just wasn't reflective of, and it was limiting. Um, and, and part of our work too is, you know, we have to review our policies to see where our own policies and practices are creating barriers. And that was creating a barrier, um, you know, because several students um, were saying, you know, were saying that they were not, um, you know, allowed to participate because their hair or their head wrap was un-American, whatever that means, right? And so, you know, that that that's that's you know, uh, you know, I, you know, I don't think that our policies are sacred. I, I think that again, um, and, and I do believe that you know they're they're drafted. Um, I'm going to assume in good intentions, but they also reflect the norms and values of what's going on at the time, right? And and that may not be you know, applicable to, you know, what's going on currently. So I, I think that it's fair to review those things, especially if they're limiting access um, to students. If, if our policies are circumventing um, our mission statements, I, I definitely think that they need to be, um, you know, reviewed and overhauled and with the, with the equity lens to make certain that it's not decreasing access for students. So Ken, that was a, a perfect segue, a question I had. Um, can you give us examples of maybe just policy pitfalls to avoid where you typically see uh, maybe unequal access just in your educational history or maybe some of the work that you're currently doing as, as a director of equity? My bad, good brother. Can you repeat the first part? Can you outline maybe some policy pitfalls to avoid where you typically see areas over and over again, maybe with work that you've done consulting or work in the current position, um, just as maybe a starting point for um, some of us in the room that have kind of that power or influence to change policy. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think, um, you know, assembling a policy committee um, that that's inclusive of everyone within the system, um, you know, students, parents, uh, associates, you know, everyone in the system and, and you know, and, and review those policies regularly, not, not in a way that, you know, we're compliant with um, what's required, you know, in terms of having a policy committee, but just really um, thoroughly, let's, let's attack these policies and, and do we have a lens for which um, we're, we're reviewing our policies to see how they may be limiting, um, or how they may be creating barriers unintentionally. Um, and, and, you know, you can really take advantage of having a diverse set of eyes and folks within the system, especially of our students. I think our students are, are, are um, underutilized and overlooked quite a bit because they are indeed the, um, you know, they're the end users of the product. And, and so, you know, we definitely, you know, should have, you know, sort of representation um, you know, on those committees that review those regularly or, or annually, you know, or, and, you know, we have an ongoing process where we just meet, um, you know, I think like at least uh, uh, once a month, um, you know, just to, or more to, to just thoroughly review um, with our um, in-house counsel um, with that equity lens to make certain, again, as I said earlier, that, you know, our policies are, are not creating barriers or that they are reflective of, you know, think about it. Many of our policies didn't have anything to cover um, vape pens, right? And so, you know, you have for a time, you had this gray area where, and, and students are really sophisticated. They're, you know, they're going to expose all the, the gray areas. And so, you know, we have to rush and hurry up and create language to speak to, you know, um, those behaviors and, and, and that reality. And, um, you know, certainly like at one point, um, you know, I don't think we had policy that cover um, you know, bullying in social media, but now that's so much a part of our lived experience and reality, you know, we have to adapt um, to address, you know, what, what's, what's, you know, impacting, you know, students, um, um, uh, faculty and staff, um, you know, in our systems. And so that, that's one um, way, um, if you already haven't, um, you know, to begin to, uh, you know, apply a, a, a critical, of equity lens, um, you know, in, in, in with reviewing, you know, some of your policies and practices and, and, and making certain that, you know, they they don't limit or create barriers um, for folks within your um, population. Yeah. 
Yes, this is Jen. We um, have a comment from Sheldon Davis, and it's kind of along both the last questions. Um, <laughs> we, hang on. I think you see the last comment. <laughs> so we can see that one, everyone. Um, another one is when making decisions, always think about what is, is best for the student. If the policies and practices don't have the best interest of the students, they need to be revisited and changed. Um, so, and then we have a question from Michelle Moy. She's class of 89 at Monmouth College. She is um, not an education major, but an assistant professor at Madonna University in Michigan. And she wonders if any of the panelists have seen issues or anticipate problems with integration of recent immigrants or refugees in the US education system. And how do you foresee the future consequences of students with refugee or asylum status? Any thoughts? I mean, I can comment for that. Yeah. So I'm not sure of the particulars in Illinois, so I certainly can't speak to them in Michigan, but there, there are certain ticks that the state wants, all right, how you mark and identify certain students, either if, if they're EL or if they're form, homeless or if they're, you know, refugees and such. And that just automatically puts a further burden of responsibility on the district to make sure that all the needs of that child are being met so that they're able to access their education. So it would be no different than if there's a child with a learning disability and, and they had an IEP or if a child had a medical condition and they need a 504. It just means that we have to work a little bit harder and we gotta bring in more people to make sure that the needs of that child are met so they can access the education. Um, as far as the refugee status and the influx zone, I, I did work in a school district where, where they weren't classified as refugees, but we had a large influx of students from all over the world. And I think the building I worked in had well over 30 languages. I mean, we had a a prayer room for we had like a large Muslim population. So it's a very diverse classroom. We REL rooms were full, filled to the brim. And those were some of the most fun just, just to get the get them in and registered and through the full, I mean all the paperwork and all the documentation that you need. And but uh in the end, I, I don't know, it's just a challenge that you have to get through in order to ensure that all your children are learning. So I, I don't think I necessarily answered your question specifically, but um, I will say though that there's extra funding from, and not that that's not why you do that, but you know, with those, there is actually some additional funding to help you out with the resources that you have to do. So, students. Speak to, you mentioned something and, and I think that this is pretty cool. There, you I assume that was at Dunlap. Yeah. And they at they you had a prayer room, so there was no pushback from that. I mean, I, I'm I'm smiling because that's that's wonderful. I mean, I I have students who live in uh, the intercultural house sometimes that will use this prayer room during you know Ramadan and and things of that nature, but. To actually hear that the school provided that for the students, um, can you speak to that a little bit? And and Kenny I, and Verona, have you are you do you see some of that? You know, in your in your schools, I'm I, I think that that's amazing. Yeah, well, I, I think. It, go ahead, I'll Jack. just clarify. It was a prayer room at the time that they needed to be a prayer room. Otherwise, it might be a in school suspension room. It might be a timeout <laughs> room. It wasn't punitive by any nature, but it, it was, uh, it, we very much identified that there was a need of our students. And, you know, I like, I'm a Christian background, so I can pray anytime I want. So it was new for me to understand 
why that this had to occur during this time of day and that it would be fluctuating and things of this nature. I'm like, oh, all right. So rather than have them leave and such, it was just easier to figure out something that worked for everybody. And um, yeah, I, because otherwise they, they were going to leave and spend and, and then they're going to come back and it was just kind of, I don't know, a big waste of time uh, as far as the transportation, not as part of their, their prayer time. But um, so I, I think that once again, you identify an issue for a student population or staff, I'll say for staff as well. I mean, quite frankly, uh, before you even were had to by law, if you had a, a nursing mother, by golly, you better find a place for that nursing mother to take care of some things because otherwise they weren't going to be there. So, you know, that, that's just what you have to do. Yeah, I had a um, going back to the question about um, immigration um, and new immigrants. I, I think it's applicable not only to um, immigrants, but to um, you know students for whom English is not their first language. Um, you know, I work in a district that you know we just have a really our, our program um, you know needs uh, a lot of support um, in in terms of how we serve um, and support these students. Um, you, you know, I, I just think that, you know, um, with more fidelity than what we've been doing, um, you know, we just, you know, find that, and it's not only just languages too. I think someone mentioned about culture barriers, right? And culture shock. Um, and, 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 you know, they need wraparound services that extend beyond um, just what we can, you know, do in the school. You know, we find that some, uh, you know, parents, um, you know, uh, may not um, be fluent English speakers and, 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 and their children are, um, you know, for the most part, um, you know, serving as, as translators and such. And, and um, we, we just, you know, we're, we're actually, you know, under a, a program review um, because we're, you know, for all the students and families that are um, eligible for services, uh, we have a large number that decline them, um, and and for several reasons. And 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 going back to resources, um, you know, a lot of these students don't want to leave their neighborhood schools uh, to go to one of two centers where they can get services. Uh, several of them, in terms of like their identity, they already stand out. Um, those who um, you know who are melanated, and 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 you know those those brown skin students, you know. Um, you know, they stand out in our system and then they stand out even more um, when they have an accent or don't, you know, speak, um, you know, English is not their first language. And, you know, kids just, they're just trying to fit in. They just want to belong and they don't want to stand out more so than what they do. So that's another reason why they decline services, even though they may be eligible for them. And, and then when they are eligible, our, our services, I think, as I mentioned, um, I, I don't know if, if you know, we are um, going beyond just the, the language piece in, in um, terms of, um, you know, some of those, uh, the culture shock and, um, in, and, and getting families connected to, um, you know, resources that may, they may need beyond three o'clock, right? And, and so those are some of the um, things that, you know, I, I've been, you know, um, experiencing, you know, for, you know, our domestic uh, students, as well as, you know, newcomers. So um, for me to answer your question, Regina, um, just in terms of, you know, have I seen or experienced um, that prayer room or just um, that shift um, in school? Um, I currently teach at um, a African-centered school. Um, and so a lot of the population um, are families that are from various, you know, kind of various parts of Africa who um, they, they practice um, different, you know, different beliefs, different, um, different holidays and things like that. And so while we don't necessarily have something specific like that set up, um, this being my second year with the school, it I've been opened up to um, just so many different cultural things that I never knew about, you know, from just watching and being able to um, honor what these students are bringing and what their families are bringing 
Um, and for me, it has been a shift because for you know, a very long time, no prayer, no, you know, it's been very kind of um, closed off to that kind of thinking outside of just we're here to learn. Um, and so I've been, you know, very excited to um, be able to partake in some cultural things and learn from my students and learn from those families. And, and it shows in how their students are proud to come to school because they can share who they are. Um, and so, you know, just to kind of go back to that question that you asked, Regina, I know I have not experienced that um, to that extent, but I have seen a shift in just how we look at um, just honoring, you know, what people, what, what others practice and just being able to be okay and comfortable with incorporating that and, and sharing that with the rest of the student population and community. Speaking from personal experience, I went through an English as second language program when I started kindergarten. And I think a lot of the times schools aren't ready for students that are have need to learn English. And they kind of just throw them in and like pick up English and kind of forget about everything else. Like forget about they're still speaking Spanish at home. They still have their culture at home. So I think with the increase of immigrants, the increase of refugees, we need to prepare not just ourselves. To accept people but like our students because my students say and like Toby said they say things that I'm just like I I can't believe you said that like let's fix this because like we need to have this conversation because if they said it there's a chance that other people in the room also think the same thing and I'm just like no not just because someone is Mexican they're going to speak Spanish not just people from Mexico are going to speak Spanish not just someone from this country is going to speak just this language, like you need to open your mind to like other perspectives and other cultures. And like what Zach said, if someone is an English second language learner comes to Farmington, I'm sure we will find resources. I'm sure we'll find someone. And I think it's just coming from a community that spoke Spanish, we had those resources. But I think as I got older, we had more culture into it. At first, it was just learn English, like this is what you need to do. But then I was like, let's start using Spanish and include your culture. Let's celebrate these things that you celebrate. And I think that's happening right now for Hispanics, and we need to start including that with other cultures as well. Thank you. Yeah, right. Question in the audience. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Tommy Green, I'm a junior here at Monmouth College. I'm a social science and education major and I'm working in the schools to do my student observation right now, but earlier in the panel, um, some of our panelists talked about giving grace to people and we talked about uh, America being very competitive and being um, very unforgiving, but what is giving grace, like what is when is it not okay to give so much grace? Like, when do you stop giving that? Because, I mean, especially our students, they're going to take advantage of any time an, an educator's guard is down. They're going to take any easy way out. They're going to try for anything. But, I mean, even your your fellow educators, um, that's my, my exact question here, is what happens when you do give someone grace on political correctness, but they repeat those actions even after you provided proper terminology because they take advantage? So I don't know if I'll answer this question directly, but I'm going to tell you a story that I hope you like. So, <laughs> so at our school, Dr. Chapman invited Regina over to do uh, the IDI, which basically probes into your, what is it, personality, into your... Your ability to facilitate cultural difference. There you go. And I take this thing, this test, one-on-one, -on -one, it's supposed to be private, I'm going to share it. And I think... <laughs> I'm an ace this thing. I get this back, and not in so many words, but I find out that I am biased toward racist people. I mean, not, not exactly, but in, I'm dismissive of people that don't agree with my opinions on that. And uh, she gave me some things to read and some things to listen to, and uh, I realized that about myself. Like, I felt like I was a person that knew right from wrong. If you were wrong, then I was going to tell you. 
But um, so I, I listened to a, a podcast by Simon Sinek, and he was talking to a lady named Dia Khan, and she she marched with these. She's uh, oh man, I don't want to mess this up. She's not white, and she marched with these people in Charlottesville, and she stayed with them for years. And in the end of it, what I got from the podcast was basically, you're not going to change somebody by arguing. If you, if somebody tells me, hey, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard, well, let's dig in and figure out why, and I'm going to fight with you about it. But over the course of time, she said over a 10-year relationship with this guy, she basically, he left this white nationalist group that he was a part of, that he'd been a leader of because of his relationship with her. And I think patience, even though it's, I know I'm not giving you the answer to your question, but one thing I've learned about myself, thanks to you know Regina and Dr. Chad and some other people, is, is patience is what it takes. And changing someone's opinion isn't an argument. Changing someone's opinion is, is caring about them and listening to them and trying to see their side of things. Because personal growth is something, if you're not ready to strive for that, you won't, you won't get it. But when you're when they're ready for personal growth, I think they'll understand that. And I think when you show them an aggressive side, it's natural for all of us to get defensive and all of us to dig in. And then to go to people that also agree with us and look for backing and support for why our argument's right. But I think in the end, it's it's still about that relationship and it's about patience. And I guess I would say, I think there's a point that you'll know where you say, you know what you're saying is wrong and I, and I disagree with you. But I would say, as hard as this is, if we're really going to be educated and we really want to change, <coughs> don't end that relationship. Um, I guess that's my, my, that's my advice. Save that relationship. And, and over time, hopefully you can work through those things. Because, you know, I see all the time in buildings, well, at least you don't talk because 10 years ago this happened. Save that relationship. That's not the life you want. That only hurts you. So, uh, I'll just add a, a tidbit to that. As, as you start in the classroom and establishing their, their report that you want to have with children, with, with your students in classroom management, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of drift over to that classroom management and uh, showing grace doesn't uh, neglect from holding people accountable. So showing grace is holding them accountable in a more private setting or something of that nature rather than in a public setting like a classroom and such. So I, I, I wouldn't convolute showing grace to like classroom management as you start in your education career um, because it is so important that, that you have that. I mean, You'll have to navigate that through your classroom experiences and with, with your mentor teachers and with your administrators in the situations that you're in. Um, well, what we're referencing is something a little bit deeper, but I, I do acknowledge that it gets very convoluted when you're trying to show grace, but yet I'm trying to keep you know the lid on this place and not get fired. So uh, I would say that just be mindful that, that that doesn't negate from people being held accountable. I will I turn it off. I would add in there to both. And I know that um, you know, this is a conversation I've had with Ken um, numerous times as as I've as I've done the work the last six years, uh, I definitely echo what Zach said. Grace and inviting people in is is, is important, right? Um, because you know, in our core, if you're a teacher, you you want people to to make a change, right? Um, but I always say dialogue is to is to learn, it's to educate, and debate is to win or lose, right? Um, but at the end of the day, sometimes, you know, and I, I appreciate Toby sharing what he, his story and his journey, um, we, you do sometimes have to cut it off. And, and there still is a certain amount. I mean, we could probably go on for another 45 minutes and have a conversation about restorative justice versus punitive justice and the 
you know, and all of those things. Um, and it's complex. And, and I think you have to really know the situation of the students and, and the scenarios to be able to kind of navigate through that a little bit um, before you can kind of pull it all the way through. So, okay. So we are almost at our, our sacred time, but um, I do want to bring up one of our last questions um, <clears throat> because I, I know it's a hot topic right now. Um, we turn on the news. I, I can't not read an article um, that talks about um, you know, revisionist history um, or critical race theory or culturally responsive teaching and learning and leading standards. Um, it's out there, right? Um, everybody has an opinion about everything, particularly how to teach, how to teach history and how to be culturally responsive in the classroom. So our last question, and we're going to open it up to our panelists um, before we pull it back together. Critical race theory and culturally responsive teaching and leading standards are being met with a tremendous amount of pushback. Um, many do not have a full understanding of, of what those two areas really are, the CRT and culturally responsive learning and teaching standards are different. Um, so my question to you all, if we've experienced it, um, can you share what critical race theory is and what it isn't? And why do you think that there is such a, a tremendous amount of pushback right now about both the culturally responsive leading and teaching standards and with CRT? Yeah, I can I can I can kick us off on the CRT piece, um, which has really been fascinating in our community in our district um, because CRT critical race theory um, first it's it's a it's a it's it's a theory um, that's you know part of the qualitative sciences. Um, it was developed by Derek Bell like almost forty years ago. Um, in, 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 at Harvard, and, and it was applied um, in legal, in the law field, and then expanded to other fields. And so this, this is not um, a new, um, you know, theory or what have you. And, 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 and so in essence, you know, a lot of people in my community have conflated critical race theory with discrimination against white folks and 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 bias towards white people and and that's not what it is at all um crt or critical race theory is, is a practice of interrogating race and racism in society um as i mentioned that emerged um a lot of it you know cited by derrick bell but also richard delgado um is another one of the you know sort of four fathers or um, um, originators, um, and then later in education with Gloria Latin Billing, and you know, it, 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 you know, it's it's in and of itself is not a substantive um, field um, um, of, of of you know, uh, or a course or a workshop, right? It's it's and a lot of people, you know, with their argument is that we don't want CRTs taught in schools. Well, you know, I don't know any K twelve system in which this is taught, it's, it's usually um, in, in um, some master programs, but primarily in terminal degree programs um, where you know, uh, folks are exposed to CRT through qualitative methods um, as one of you know, many ways in which to apply this lens um, through which uh, educators can um, help students to examine the role of racism in America. Um, it, CRT, you know, it recognizes the value of centering the voices of people who have historically been marginalized. That, that's what it is. Um, you know, a, a lot of folks, um, a, as I mentioned, have conflated it to, to, to mean discrimination or bias towards white people. And a lot of the argument that I'm, I'm hearing is, you know, in some of these um, laws, like in Iowa House File 802 is, you know, we don't, we don't, you, we don't want you, know, you to teach people to feel guilty. And I don't know any educator that does that, but there's this assumption 
And what's interesting about, you know, that position is that, you know, we, we're, we're worried about the, the um, you know, uh, exposing white kids, you know, to um, factual history um, in which, you know, our country, um, you know, on more than one occasion, um, you know, uh, subjugated or, um, you know, uh, you know, engaged in, in practices that um, uplifted one group and, and, and um, took away from, you know, another. And, 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 you know, and it's interesting because no one is worried about the lived experiences of, of racism um, or, or discrimination that many of our students experience on a regular basis. We have this really stupid thing in our, in our school district where white kids go up to black kids and they, they, they go all out. They, they cut out and laminate these N-word pass cards and basically say, you know, if you're my black friend or if you're somebody that, that you know, I know that's black, you in essence, if you sign this card, you give me permission to use the N-word um, without any kind of um, recourse or what have you. And so, you know, and again, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not making this up. And so I think about, you know, the students, you know, who, you know, they live with these microaggressions, these micro assaults, these micro inequities on a regular basis, um, you know, and, 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 and no one is concerned about their lived experience because, we, you know, the, 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 the concern is more about we don't want to make students, in, you know, feel bad or guilty um, for um, past practices, you know, of our country or what have you. And so I think that there's some really missed opportunities um, to create empathy and, and to create um, a sense, and, you know, see, really seeking and teaching truth. Um, another thing that, you know, CRT has been used a lot, I hear people say um, it's uh, indoctrination. And, and that's interesting to me because the indoctrination, you know, in and of itself, it, 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 it teaches, um, you know, people or it's a process or a set of beliefs, um, you know, to, to, to um, you know, to, to be uh, uncritical, right? And that, you know, you just take it for, you know, we, we force something down your throat and you just take it for face value where, you know, as I mentioned, CRT is an interrogation, it's an examination, um, and, and it's the very opposite of, you know, this whole piece around indoctrination. And in fact, in many of our school districts, we're teaching um, critical um, thinking skills so that students um, have these skill sets to be able to analyze um, and, and you know, to develop an analysis so that they're not vulnerable to indoctrination. And, and that's what a lot of our, the aims of many of our school districts. And so, um, you, you know, this, this uh, attack on CRT is just sort of the latest in the culture wars, you know, um, today at CRT, I don't know what what is is going to be next, um, but it's really a whole lot to do about nothing. But I really, I, but I really can't say that because you know we have like 14 states and growing um, that have laws that are you know severely limiting um, how we teach truth in history and social studies, um, and and I think that that's a disservice to all students. Um, you know, like any, like anything, um, whether it's language or learning a new skill, you don't get better at it doing it one time. We, we won't get better at talking about race and discrimination um, and our lived histories if, if we don't create spaces in which we can have these conversations to build up our skills so that, you know, we know how to, um, you know, be more aware and, and really identify um, when you know our systems, our policies are are creating barriers um, for 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 students. So I'll, I'll end that. That's my that's my whole rant on CRT. I didn't think that was a rant. Thank you for sharing that. Um, anybody else? Who who's gonna add something to that? <laughs> great job, great job. Okay, um, we are right at eight o'clock. And so I know one of the things that we discussed as we were prepping for the panel was we wanted to make sure that we left both our virtual and our in-person audience with um, some positives about uh, the process of becoming a teacher or 
you know, attaining those lovely CEVUs um, and all of those things. So in, in closing, um, we're going to have just a, a, a brief discussion. Um, what advice uh, would you give to a new teacher as um, they're just getting ready to set out and, and be a teacher? So that is for our, our teacher prep candidates. And then for our more, our, our veteran teachers and any admins that are here or virtually, um, if your district is just beginning its journey to explore policy or professional development or any of those things um, to support your teachers and your staff, can you, can you speak to that? Where do you start, where do you go, and what sort of things are, should you do? Being the newest teacher, I guess, in this group. Um, my advice would be if you're ready to adapt, um, especially when I've had to, coming from Chicago to teach to a rural district and having to have conversations with kids, I expected it to go a different way. I expected me to be like, oh, that's not right. Like, let's change this. And I'd be like, okay. And it's not how it happens. They, they will fight back. They will say, well, this is what I was taught. This is what my parents say. And you kind of just have to be ready for not to go your way to have multiple conversations over the same thing. Because having one conversation with one kid isn't going to fix it. And it's just, it's been hard, I think, just to coming from like a culture that accepts people and that will have these conversations to a rural community that doesn't have these conversations very often. And like you need to remind people like to be open to different perspectives, open to different cultures. And I think that's just something I wish I was more aware of. But also I think like the brightest thing that has happened is like I had this conversation with, like we don't use this anymore. Like or like let's not use that word anymore. Let's change it to this. And then someone used it the next time. And a different student was like, we've had this discussion, like you need to change that. And that just I don't mean to me, it's like, well, at least something, like we are changing something for the future. I'm not ready. <laughs> I'm not ready. Don't, never not <laughs> so I'll piggyback a little bit off what Lily was talking about. It, you'll, you'll spend so much time preparing your lessons and making sure that you're meeting all the learners in your classroom and your head will be spinning with all, all the other muck that administration and such pushes down on you. And, and I would be the, a person that would be pushing those things down upon you. Um, <laughs> but getting back to what Lily said, you have to plan for everything and then you're still going to miss stuff. So that's an example where you want to give your, show yourself a low grace. Um, because if you plan to, you know, really, really well and you still miss something, well, you need to give yourself a little grace because it wasn't for a lack of effort. It was for a lack of experience and you'll get it fixed. And then you need to keep fostering those relationships so you get to what Lily was referencing, that you're a community of learners in there. You're, you're just helping facilitate it. You're, you're not doing the teaching. You're a part of the learning process for all of them, and we're all accountable for making everyone feel equal and of value. So foster that relationship, and we're all going to hold each other accountable, and then you can really get growth that you're looking for. That helped you? Thank you. <laughs> I think one thing, uh, as a young teacher, kids will talk about anything in front of you. And I think it becomes really easy to turn a blind eye. But I think you need to think about if you hear a kid say something that's inappropriate, don't not address it because you are setting that kid up for embarrassment sometime down the road when someone does. You don't have to embarrass them in front of everybody, but pull them aside. I heard what you were talking about with your friend. Here's why that's not, here's why that's not what we say. And educate them because I think a lot of times people think, well, it'll just go away if I act like I don't hear it. And, and we've all done that. Everybody that's ever been a teacher has done that. 
it does have to be a fight, but if you don't address it, you're doing them a disservice as well. And, and the second piece of advice I'll give you is 99% of the kids that you encounter in their, especially junior, I live, I live with the junior high kids, so I know 99% of people are, of, of these kids are at a point in their life where they're trying to be like everybody else and fit in. You know, we spend we spend half our lives trying to be like everybody else, half our lives trying to prove why we're not like them, right? But most of the kids you're gonna deal with are trying to fit in. So when they acknowledge something or stand up and say something that makes them different, celebrate that with them. That that's courageous. If nothing else, that's courageous. So keep that in mind with your kids when, when there's something different. Um, I just wanted to say, first of all, welcome to the family for the new teachers um, who are working towards this. So welcome to the family. Um, but then also for the veteran teachers, congratulations for making it this far. Um, and thank you for, you know, the work that you're doing. Um, I would say for me, um, a piece of advice that I would, would want to give my younger self would be um, to just make sure that, that you are taking the time to connect. So going into the classroom, you know, you have your lesson plans, all of that, and kind of just along the same lines as everyone else has mentioned, um, but be intentional, be purposeful in how you connect and, and make those connections, not just with your students, but with their families. Um, you know, use a lot of that beginning part of that school year, that first six weeks really is important to building those relationships and building that trust because in order for your students and families to, to um, want to come back to see you every day and for your students to want to learn from you, they have to be able to trust that you have their best interest in mind. Um, and that's a lot when, especially in my case, when you have 30 students and 30 families sitting in front of you, it, it's, it's difficult, but it makes your job down the road so much easier with those families and with the students. Um, and then the second thing um, is it's okay to mess up. It's okay to fail. It's okay to make a mistake in front of your students. It is okay to say the wrong thing. You know, as long as you're showing yourself and the students and your families that you're willing to learn um, from those mistakes or from those mishaps um, and, and bring them in into your process as well. Um, but really the, the most important thing, and I didn't learn this, you know, until a few years into, into teaching, but making those connections and just listening to your students and, and trying your best to meet them where they are um, will give you much success down the road. Just be the one. Um, everyone, um, I think at this point, it may be safe to say or assume that, you know, there was someone um, that inspired you uh, to, um, you know, come you know to to follow this path uh, of being an educator and 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 there's a lot of power um and responsibility with that um you know be be you know be that firefighter right have the vision for you know a kiddo um beyond what they may even see for themselves get to know them after three o'clock just as 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 ronnie just alluded to i mean there's is it, you know, they spend a lot of their day with you, but how can you leverage what you know about that kiddo after three o'clock, um, you know, to make them feel cared for, make them feel understood, um, make them feel like um, somebody just, you know, um, you know, cares and, 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 and wants them to succeed and um, set them up for success and, 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 and doing that and preparing you know, um, you know, and, and helping that kid to be successful, you also have to take care of yourself too. And that's something as educators, we don't do a good job of is self-care. And so whatever that may be, um, you know, you, you know, you know, we, we also have to, um, you know, be mindful that, you know, we want to be, um, you know, uh, 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 you know, highly, you know, skilled and, and, and um, effective, you know, educators, you know, we, we also have to take care of, of ourselves, um, you know, so that, you know, we can be in a position to help, you know, our babies um, to, you know, achieve, um, you know, grade level standards and, and, and beyond um, and, and be a, you know, a catalyst in, in change and transformation um, and helping them to become you know, things that, you know, they didn't even think 
that they were, um, you know, uh, uh, had the capability of becoming. That self-care is so important. <laughs> The other part of that question was for veteran teachers. Um, speak for just a couple of moments. Um, what are, how do you get started? Where do you tackle professional development? What are some things that you do to, you know, to move to help move the needle forward? Um, I, for me, it, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Sorry. For me, it was really, really important to figure out. Um, just my strengths. So what was I passionate about? What did I like? I, as a student, I was not a math kid, hated it, you know, and this is something that I will share with my class to this day. You know, I'm very um, upfront about that because, you know, then they can see, even though you have those challenges, you know, you're able to um, still do great things and, and, and be productive. Um, but for me, it is just finding what it is that you love um, and tapping into that right away. So Math may not have been my thing, but I was really passionate about um, growing students as writers, as readers. Um, and so I began just, you know, building that piece of my um, professional side, just making sure I was as strong as I could in that piece that I was passionate about, um, because there are so many things to tackle when you are an educator. Um, and then building on that, you know, that that will tap you into other things that you may never knew that you had an interest in and sharing that with your students. Um, but but being sure that you understand like where your strength lies, where your passion is, um, and then that will show through your students. Um, that for me, that was the most helpful thing. Was there another part that I missed? No. That was it. Zach, Toby, Chris, do you have anything you want to add? I believe we get out early. All right. So, great right, team. Thank you for uh, staying with us for a few extra minutes. Um, to our virtual, um, to our virtual audience, to our in-person audience, I hope that this was tremendously beneficial for all of you. Um, I hope this will be something that we will be doing again to my peers, um, both virtually and in person. Thank you for sharing the stage and, and thank you um, for providing us with your great wisdom this evening. So thank you, everybody. Um, Jen has some just kind of closing things very quickly. All right, everyone, thank you for coming on behalf of the alumni office. Um, we will be, you'll see a short survey if you're online, if you're in the classroom, we'll email you a short survey. Let us know your thoughts. Let us know what other program you'd like to see. So thanks, everybody, and have a great night.